This episode is dedicated to our dear listener Marnie, and it is brought to you by Sacred Geometries. Tonight, we'll read from Stonehenge, Today and Yesterday, written by Frank Stevens and published in 1916. Stonehenge is a prehistoric monument on Salisbury Plain in Wiltshire, England, One of the most famous landmarks in the United Kingdom, Stonehenge is regarded as a British cultural icon. The whole monument, now in ruins. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Now, take a few deep breaths. Salisbury Plain To the local man, of Wiltshire, England, the word plain will ever summon up a vision of rolling downs, a short, crisp, elastic turf dotted with flocks and broken here and there by some crested ancient and mysterious earthwork tomb in ruins which rears itself from the undulating down and breaks the skyline with its sharp outline. It has been estimated that fully one half of Wiltshire consists of these high bare chalk downs which rise in bold rounded bluffs from the valleys which thread their way through the country. It is impossible to escape them. The Cotswold Shepherd looks downward on their folds and marks the gleaming white of the occasional chalk pit which breaks the surface of their scarp. The huntsman in the vale of the white horse and the farmer on the fringe of the shady depths of the new forest alike live in the presence of the Wiltshire Downs. There is something of grandeur in the immensity of their broad unbroken line stretching as they do or did for mile upon mile, limited only by the horizon, a rolling sea of green pasture. And the very heart of the downs is the plain of Salisbury. The pasturage of the downs and the rich woodland of these valleys must have been important factors in those old days when the builders of Stonehenge pushed inland from the coast, seeking a spot wherein they might settle. As a general rule, it may be held with considerable certainty, not only in Wiltshire, but also in other parts of England, that our early settlers from the continent elected to live on the downland, rather than in the valleys. 
Go where you may over the plain. Its turfy surface is scored by ancient agricultural terraces, or lynchets, telling the tale of the ancient plowman's furrows on the slopes. And side by side with them lie the scars of what were once cattle enclosures, farms, and stockaded villages. Nor is the explanation far to seek for the valleys afforded shelter to the wolves and were in places obstructed by undrained marshes, unhealthy and unfitted for the herdsman and his flocks, and impenetrable as regards roads, midway between the valleys of the Natter and the Avon lies Stonehenge, a megalithic monument without an equal in this country, about which the legend of the peasant, as well as the speculation of the savant, have gathered in an ever-increasing volume. The bibliography of Stonehenge alone comprises nearly a thousand volumes, and it is hard to pick up an old magazine or periodical which does not contain some notice of it. County historians, astronomers, Egyptologists, and antiquaries have argued, as old Omar would say, about it and about, until the man of ordinary tastes who chances to visit the spot to study the stones finds himself confronted with such a mass of evidence, of theory and a fantastic speculation that he sadly turns aside, befogged, or may be fired by the example of others evolves from his inner consciousness yet another theory of his own to add to the already plethoric accumulation on the subject. Stonehenge Stonehenge is one of those historical monuments which possesses the disadvantage of a reputation. The first impression is always one of disappointment. The circle appears so much smaller than it really is by reason of its isolated situation. Its proportions are dwarfed by the wide expanse of downland which surrounds it. This feeling of disappointment, however, gradually gives place to one of wonder as the stones are approached more closely and their bulk is seen in true proportion. The diameter of the outer circle of stones is 108 feet or almost exactly that of the internal diameter of the dome of St. Paul's. A casual glance, even at the monument, is sufficient to show that its basic form is intended to be a circle. The earthwork which girdles the stones is circular, Within this stands the remnant of a circle of thirty upright stones, bearing imposts upon them. Within this again is what was once a circle of smaller stones. Inside these three outer circular forms are two others, shaped like a horseshoe. The first consisted of the five large trilithons. Huge pylons of stone, comprising two uprights and an impost, standing separate, while in front of them is the remnant of a horseshoe of small upright stones, similar to those which comprise the inner circle of the monument. At first, 
It may seem difficult to disentangle the chaos of fallen stone which meets the eye, but when once the original design of this structure is grasped, it becomes easy to piece together again in imagination a work which even in the light of modern and scientific engineering presents very considerable difficulties and problems. Lying flat within these concentric circles and horseshoes is a single, flat, tabular block generally known as the altar stone. From this slab, now almost buried beneath the remains of a fallen trilothon, the visitor may look in a northeasterly direction and through the arches of the outer circle observe the heel stone, or friar's heel, which stands at some considerable distance from the main structure. On the summer solstice, or longest day, the sun rises immediately over the top of this monolith when viewed from the center of the altar stone. Such, then, are the facts which meet the eye when standing within Stonehenge. Each minute the stones appear to increase in bulk, and the problem of their coming grows more inscrutable. Then, if wearied with such vastness, the eye may wander over the surrounding plain, broken in almost every direction by the mounds or barrows which cluster to the number of two hundred or more about the venerable stone circle. The connection between Stonehenge and the barrows seems almost irresistible. The hands which raised those huge monoliths must assuredly have been laid to rest almost within the touch of their shadow. Stonehenge and the Barrows, each casting light upon the other's origin, confirming and reconfirming each other's existence, knit together today as yesterday by a bond of close union which even time and speculations cannot sever. Whether worn and overgrown by lichen, it is not possible at the present day to see clearly the nature of the stones which go to make up Stonehenge. For that reason, only the barest outline of the monument as it appears to the unknowing eye has been given in order that the original plan may be grasped thoroughly before entering into those important issues which help to solve the enigma of its origin. Careful investigation reveals the fact that the stones vary very much in material and that, further, just as the stones are placed in systematic order, so too has the same care been exercised in the selection of the material from which each circle or horseshoe has been built. Moreover, just as the stones can be divided into groups of uprights and imposts or trilothons and simple uprights, so too has it been found that while all the trilothons are composed of a local stone known generally as sarsen, all the simple uprights are of foreign stone, sometimes classed together roughly as cyanite. The simple uprights are all foreign to the county of Wiltshire, whereas the larger sarsen blocks are to be found in considerable numbers scattered over the Wiltshire Downs. This difference in material 
seems to present a considerable difficulty, and the question naturally arises, how did the foreign stones come to Salisbury Plain? The sarsen stones resemble gigantic lumps of coarse sugar. These huge stones are to be found, though, in decreasing numbers, scattered all over the plain, and particularly along the ridges of Marlborough Downs. The country folk, always picturesquely minded, call them gray weathers, and indeed, in North Wilts, it is not hard to conjure up their poetic resemblance to a flock of titanic sheep reclining at ease upon the pasturage of the downs. The alternative name, Sarsen, has an interesting derivation. It is a corruption of the word Sarsen, meaning heathen. But what have Saracens to do with Wiltshire? Frankly, nothing. The name has come to the stones from Stonehenge itself, and is a part of that ever-interesting confusion of ideas which has been bequeathed to us by our ancestors of the Middle Ages. To them, all stone circles and megalithic monuments were the work of heathens. Heathenism in all its works, was roundly condemned. Consequently, the stones of Stonehenge were Saracen, or heathen stones, which the Wilshire tongue has shortened in due time to Saracen. The Saracen well repays a close examination a glance at one of these stones as it lies on the downland shows that it has suffered greatly from the weather. It is the core, or kernel, of a much larger block of sandstone, worn away on all sides by wind and weather. Moreover, these isolated blocks appear on the downs in a country devoid of any rock save chalk. And the proof of this is not far to seek. The chalk of the London Basin is still capped by layers of such sandstone as may be seen at Purefleet in Essex. The titanic sheep, or grey weathers, therefore are merely a small residue of that widespread sandy deposit which once covered the whole of the south of England with its inhospitable sheet and of which larger patches remain today in Surrey, Hampshire, and the Isle of Wight. The hand of man has likewise borne its share. In a district like the plain, Devoid of building material other than flint, these stones have attracted the unwelcome attention of the farmers. Walls, gate posts, and paving stones have accounted for many. Hence, it is not surprising that the number of sarsen stones to be found on the plain where nature placed them is becoming less and less. Indeed, the time may yet come when they will be as extinct as the great bustard who once strutted among them, and their memory will survive only in their accidental use in a prehistoric monument like Stonehenge. The Foreign Stones while the Sarsens usually awake the greatest interest by reason of their bulk and the problem of how a primitive people was able to deal with them, a far greater problem is presented by the small uprights 
or foreign stones, the like of which cannot be matched within a hundred miles of Salisbury Plain, while some can only be found upon the continent of Europe. Fragments carefully removed and submitted to mineralogists have made this fact abundantly clear, and consequently it is possible to arrive at the very definite conclusion that Stonehenge is certainly not a Wiltshire monument, and probably that is not even British at all. Where have the stones come from? One school of writers ventures to suggest that the foreign stones were transported to the plain as boulders of the glacial drift. It has even been stated that the gravels of the district contain small pebbles composed of rock similar to these mysterious foreign stones. The statement has indeed been made, but as yet no Wiltshire geologist has produced one of these pebbles of which so much is written and so little seen. These glacial drift theorists further account for the absence of these foreign stones elsewhere than at Stonehenge by yet another theory, that they, like most of the Sarsons, have all been used up for millstones, gateposts, and road metal. There are many millstones and gateposts in Wiltshire, but where is the one which corresponds in any way of the upright foreign stone at Stonehenge? The production of pebbles from the gravels of Wilts or of a specimen gatepost or millstone would at once settle this question. Unhappily, this tangible evidence is wanting. So alluring as the glacial drift theory may appear, it must reluctantly be set aside for want of convincing evidence. Finally, there seems every reason to believe that the small upright stones are naturalized aliens from abroad is why they have been described at the commencement of this section as foreign stones. It must not be taken for granted that the small upright stones at present standing represent all the foreign rocks employed. Probably they are merely the hardest and most durable of those used in the original structure, the softer and more friable examples having disappeared entirely. Owing to the action of the weather, and possibly also to the assaults of the unchecked relic monger, who until recent years could with his hammer collect souvenirs with impunity. In this connection, there is a story afoot that a hammer was kept upon the mantelpiece of a well-known hotel in Salisbury, which was reserved for those intending to see Stonehenge, who might be wishful to bring back some convincing evidence of their visit. In all probability, these foreign stones originally numbered 45. Today, there are but 30. A very striking proof that many of these foreign stones have disappeared is to be found in the wide gaps which exist today in certain parts of the circle that such gaps were originally filled by standing stones is beyond question. It is highly probable that careful and scientific excavation may add greatly to our knowledge in this direction.
There is yet one other point of interest in connection with these foreign stones. On entering the circle from the northeast, the usual path taken by visitors, a recumbent foreign stone will be noticed on the left-hand side, which has two cavities worked in it. This is the only worked foreign stone in the whole monument, and at first sight these cavities may possibly suggest themselves as mortis holes, similar to those of the sarsen trilithons. It has even been suggested that the small uprights once carried imposts or lintel stones, similar to the trilithons, on the evidence of this stone. Such a theory, however attractive, should be accepted with due caution, for the cavities on the stone are far from the ends, and situated too close together to justify a comparison with the existing sarsen trilithons of the outer circle. This stone has never yet been explained and its position defined, consequently, it is omitted from the frontispiece. The Stones Without the Circle Outside the circle of trilothons stand three stones, which have not as yet been described in detail, since they do not fall within the geometrical arrangement of the circle. They are, however, of the highest importance, as it is from them and from their position that it is possible to gather some conclusions as to one use to which the structure may have been put. within the circular earthwork, lying in a line northwest and southeast are two small, untrimmed sarsen, while outside the earthwork stands yet another unworked sarsen, already referred to as the heel stone, or friar's heel. The fact that these three sarsen are unworked, while all the others show very marked traces of dressing or trimming, is one that should be remembered. These three stones occupy no haphazard position either. As already stated, the heel stone marks the rising of the sun on the summer solstice. The remaining two mark both its rising on the winter solstice and its setting on the summer solstice. The heel stone, or friar's heel. This stone, as being the largest of this group of three, and such a conspicuous feature in the structure, demands something more than mere passing mention. It is a monolith of unwrought stone, standing 16 feet high. Such untrimmed stones are to be found all the world over in connection with religious rites. The word heel, from which the stone takes its name, probably derived from the Anglo-Saxon verb hillen to conceal and is so applied to the stone because it conceals the sun at rising on the day 